Hello and welcome to Connecting Hawaii Business on ThinkTech Hawaii. My name is Kathleen Lee, owner of Kathleen Lee Consulting, and I am your host for this program. ThinkTech Hawaii is live streamed on thinktechhawaii.com as well as on ThinkTech Hawaii's Facebook and YouTube pages. And for all the viewers out there today, you may send us questions since it is live streamed by emailing them to questions at thinktechhawaii.com. For today, I am excited to welcome the Executive Director of HICIA, which is the Hawaii Cannabis Industry Association, Randy Gon. Hey, Randy, thank you for being on the show today. Aloha, thank you so much for inviting me on. I was excited to talk to you today. Of course, so tell us, tell our viewers about yourself and your background, just to start us off. Sure. Um, I've been in Hawaii for a little over 10 years, um, and uh, I've kind of done a, a myriad of different positions in, in Hawaii professionally. Um, I started out working at the legislature when I was uh, going to grad school, and uh, actually my undergrad as well at HPU. Uh, I got my graduate degree in sustainability, and then I started working uh, as a legislative aide, um, drafting legislation for uh, Representative Matt Lopresti out in Eva Beach. I did that for a few sessions, and then um, I ended up working in the governor's office for a year. Um, it was attached to the governor's coordinator on homelessness office. Um, and then I trans transitioned into this position, uh, which is now the executive director of the HICIA. And uh, it came about in an interesting way. Um, I had always been an advocate, uh, an activist for uh, social justice or uh, other causes, drug reform, things like that. I sit on the board of the Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii which is Hawaii's longest standing um, drug, kind of a uh, compassionate drug law for change organization. And uh, this was a really timely position and move for me. And I'm really happy to, to be on that forefront of change here in Hawaii. That's wonderful. Thank you for giving us um, a brief summary of your background, which it, it really goes towards you know, the line of advocacy. So. As the executive director of HICIA, Randy, what do you do? What does the organization do? Well, it's a great question. Um, what don't I do, I think, is a better question. Um, I'm the only employee at HICIA, but my board of directors um, are the licensed uh, cannabis dispensary owners in, of Hawaii. Um, so back in 2015, we passed the medical cannabis uh, dispensary legislation. Um, and did a bidding process and awarded eight licensees the opportunity to, to serve patients in Hawaii um, for clean regulated uh, cannabis in Hawaii. And uh, they formed this organization to kind of uh, help them, um, you know, advocate, educate, um, and kind of build an industry on their behalf. And uh, I was, I believe I'm like the, the fourth director that they've had. Um, and uh, I started right around April of 2021, um, or excuse me, 2022, right before the pandemic. So, um, yeah, it's been an inter interesting ride. I, I started right when the pandemic started. So it was uh, interesting to kind of like having to meet my board members virtually. <laughs> so it's a relatively new organization is what I'm hearing. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, relatively okay. new, um, but needing to fill a need, uh, a big puka that has existed for a long time. And in the cannabis space, there has been um, a lot of siloed organizations that kind of work in their in their zone. And HICA really tries to be an umbrella organization. Okay, I think that's, that's awesome. Um, so uh, what is, for those who may not be keeping track, or even for those who are, um, what is the status of legalization of cannabis in Hawaii currently? Sure. So currently, we only have a medical cannabis program uh, in the state. So that means in, in order to uh, consume cannabis, uh, especially from the dispensary system, uh, legally, you have to get a 329 card. And that's a reference to the law, Hawaii Revised Statutes 329. Um, you register uh, through the Department of Health. You go see a service provider um, or a, a registering physician or APRN who can issue you a, essentially a prescription to use medical cannabis. Um, and then um, once you get your card, uh, they do it electronically now. They used to send it in the mail, but you can just do it electronically. You can go to the dispensary um, and they check your card and check your ID, and then you can um, uh, purchase your, your medicine there. Uh, currently, we don't have a recreational or adult use program. Uh, we did decriminalize three grams of cannabis or less 
uh, but it still comes with a like a, a fine, kind of like a traffic ticket essentially. Um, but we are we are seeing a lot of conversations around uh, legalization or what we would like to call adult use or recreational use cannabis in the state. Um, and I would say that we are closer um, than ever before to seeing a really serious um, conversation and legislative package to go forward with uh, legalization in Hawaii. Um, we don't have a uh, what they call a referendum like other states like California and Oregon and Washington, how they passed their legalization where they can have the, uh, the members of the public vote on a referendum. Uh, it has to be passed via our legislative system. So our elected officials have to put together a package and then pass it via the legislature. So we're, we're waiting on that. It's a, a few years away. Okay, so let's, let's go off of that. So when you mention your background and what you're passionate about, which is an advocate for social justice, could mm-hmm. you go over or make the connection between, um, you know, legalization of cannabis and social justice? How are the two connected? Um, it, it's interesting because I could go on a really long-winded answer here, but I'll, I'll try to keep it as short as possible. As we know, um, a lot of information has come out in the past decade or two about the impact on the war on drugs has had in our society, uh, not only in our state, um, not only in our nation, but around the world. And um, that has just far implications into different parts of our lives. Uh, we've seen minority communities be uh, un, un, uh, fairly targeted. We have seen um, low level possession um, put people in jail for a very long time and, and really prevent them from being successful community members. Um, so really it, it's a social justice and economic justice an environmental justice issue. It's really an all encompassing issue when you think about um, how we've, we've kind of made a plant that grows um, you know, pretty prolifically in, in the world to make it illegal and really locked people up um, just for possessing, right? And, um, you know, what we're seeing right now around the nation is a really move away from the, the criminalization of possession. Um, so a lot of nonviolent drug offenders um, have been um, in states that have legalized are getting released from prison and having their records expunged, which I think is a great thing. Um, and we will welcome that when it comes to Hawaii. And thank you for um, bringing that up as, as well. And what, a, what is the status of the dispensaries in Hawaii currently? Sure, we are um, kind of exiting what I call like the infancy stage of an industry. Um, again, the, the law that was crafted for the dispensaries to be up and running was in 2015, but we've had medical cannabis in Hawaii since the year 2000. So we've been here for a long time. We were actually the first state um, in the nation to pass it via the legislature, a medical cannabis program. But it took us 15 years to, to have um, the state to, to license and sanction a place to purchase your medicine um, and a clean, tested, regulated version of that. So um, as it currently stands, you know, we're roughly you know, coming out of our fifth year of operations, essentially. Um, licenses uh, were able to kind of get up and get going, but the first sale didn't start till about 2017. And it takes a while to stand up um, a business in the, the current regulated market. In my opinion, it's one of the, the hev- most heavily regulated and difficult um, industries to operate in. Um, so currently, we are seeing you know all dispensaries um, are still around and still operating, but they are um, you know having a difficult time really navigating um, the heavy regula- regulate- regulated industry we have. Um, and that's not only specific to Hawaii; that's also nationwide. Um, I don't think any industry or any licensee currently has uh, turned a profit yet, uh, given the, the way that we are structured. We what we call a vertically integrated model in Hawaii, where um, each licensee has to do everything from seed to sale. They have to you know, manufacture, they have to package, they have to um, you know, grow, they have to have their own facility, they have to have their own retail. So you can't outsource any of those um, operations, things like that. So you know, capital investment just to get started is, is humongous. Um, and we're seeing that around the nation again. Um, this is happening because there's so many different layers to this industry. Um, one being it's federally uh, still not recognized as a legal um, option for medicine. So there are restrictions like a normal business to get started can write off um, employee costs, costs for a new vehicle, things like that. In the cannabis industry, you cannot write off anything for a uh, section of the tax code called 280E, 
And so effectively, after you add in the taxes that are uh, in, in Hawaii, we have GET that we operate under um, and what we can't write off, our effective tax rate you know, can get up close to 70% in the cannabis industry. Um, and you know, when you think about the capital investment to get started, you know, I, I would throw a ballpark operation range for a licensees in Hawaii, probably upwards of, of 10 million to just to open their doors. Um, you know, how many, um, how much medicine at a certain price range do you have to sell just to make back your initial investment, not even to keep your lights on? And it's, it's a pretty high cost. So we are currently seeing, you know, um, higher, quote unquote, higher prices that you would um, in the kind of what we call the illicit market or the, the market that has existed in Hawaii for your cannabis needs for a very, very long time. You know, uncle down the road who grows or someone who has a, a larger grow operation, but it has, doesn't have a license. Um, they have lower overhead costs and, and don't have to uh, really abide by the same rules that the cannabis dispensaries do. So it's a really tough game out there, especially when your competitors are, um, you know, have 50 years of established um, relationships in Hawaii. Um, and it's not to say that those individuals are somehow bad. Um, we think that, you know, what Hawaii should do is, is create a regulatory environment, create a program that brings the individuals who have operated in the quote unquote illicit market into the light, allow them to operate in a regulated space where they don't have to worry about law enforcement coming to their homes. They don't have to worry about, um, you know, if their operation is going to get shut down, things of that nature. So uh, it's a tough industry right now. In my opinion, again, one of the toughest, not only in the nation, but specifically in the state, given the heavy regulations we have. Well, based on that, it looks like we have a couple of questions, but we are about to go and break in the next couple of minutes. But if sure. you're able to answer this one question before we go, um, someone asked, can I smoke in public if I have a, a prescription or a card? Uh, currently, no, you cannot. Um, uh, only uh, it, to take your medicine is, is authorized in a private setting. Um, so, you know, we recommend to do it at your home or, or somewhere safe where you know you're uh, can administer your, your medicine and, and not um, cause a disturbance, I guess, per se. They, they, still, they still can cite you for um, having cannabis out in public. Okay. Thank you, Randy, for, for clarifying that and for answering mm -hmm. that question. We are going to go on break, but when we return, we'll address a few more questions and um, learn more about the cannabis industry in Hawaii from Randy Gunn. So stay tuned. I'm Mitch Ewan, host of Hawaii, State of Clean Energy on Think Tech Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, is about following the many clean energy initiatives in Hawaii. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, appears weekly on Think Tech Hawaii at 4 p.m. on Wednesdays. Thank you so much for watching our show. We'll see you then. Aloha. Welcome back to Connecting Hawaii Business on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Kathleen Lee, and today's guest is Randy Gons, Executive Director of HICIA, which is the Hawaii Cannabis Industry Association. So when we left, left off, we had um, a question from a viewer that Randy answered, which was um, whether or not folks could smoke in public. And the answer is no, currently. <laughs> uh, and another question that came up was, what is the advantage for legalization of marijuana? Sure. Um, I think we could do an entire television show or more <laughs> on the advantages of legalization of Hawaii in Hawaii or around the nation in sure. general. Um, Let's try to fit in like sure. the, the I'll, Randy I'll summary, right? Yeah. yeah. Like if I'm tuning in and someone said, well, why? Why should we legalize it? Like, yeah. what would you say as someone who is spearheading? 
an organization sure. that is advocating for this? Sure. I'll start off by kind of talking a little bit about my personal story with cannabis. Um, I served in the United States Air Force for six years um, during the height of uh, both the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, and when I came home, um, you know, I was dealing with a lot of, uh, you know, post-war issues that a lot of our troops do. Um, and I was able to turn to plant medicine to really um, help me um, treat those ailments, uh, you know, become a more grounded person and really stay away from some of the uh, pharmaceuticals that had really uh, long-term effects and didn't work with other uh, pharmaceutical drugs that they had prescribed. And uh, living in a place like Hawaii that has such a deep history with plant medicine, the, the legalizing this provides more access to those who want to have therapeutic uh, med medicinal um, practices in their lives. Um, and you know, there's gonna be plenty of provisions to make sure just like any other intoxicant that it stays out of the hands of children and those who, who should not have um, but for those who are responsible and, and can make informed choices about their health, uh, legalizing cannabis will provide an amazing access to an amazing plant with, um, you know, tons of new research on the health benefits, not only the psychoactive effects, but um, all the other uh, cannabinoids that, that interact with your endocannabinoid system, which is a system like our nervous system that our body has, that is a kind of a, a newer um, area of research that we're going into that you know, it's showing great, great um, effects for depression, anxiety, um, hypervigilance. In some cases, um, like the CBG uh, cannabinoid, there was just a, a study released about its um, effects on cancer. Um, so, you know, legalization not only is going to provide access, but it's going to open up new avenues for study. So currently, a lot of places can't study cannabis because it is legal. Once we legalize, we can see a hub in uh, in Hawaii, we really think that Hawaii could be a hub for research with UH um, have doing a tons of research and, and CTAR at UH um, Agricultural School and things like that. So that the potential um, there is, is huge. And then again, what we were talking before um, to repair the harm on the war on drugs is keeping our children out of jail for possession. Um, and those that do have um, drug issues to seek treatment. Um, and that's another part of this is that, that um, when we are able to earn some revenue um, from the state and things like that, that'll go directly into um, treatment programs and, and able to get people help. And we see that disparity in communities, uh, more affluent communities. Normally those uh, children in the affluent communities don't go to prison, they go to rehab. And uh, those in the uh, harder socioeconomic communities go to jail and they don't get rehab. So um, legalization effects are, are, are huge. Um, benefits for our society. And uh, I really, again, welcome when that comes to Hawaii. Let's, let's go into that because there is a question that is connected to legalization. And the question mm -hmm. is, does it matter that the federal government still views marijuana as an illegal narcotic? Um, this, is a, this is a debate in the community currently. Um, some would say yes and some would say no. I personally say yes. It always matters what the federal government thinks um, about uh, how we live our lives and how they, they continue to craft policies um, uh, around what we do um, and our, our personal choices. So, for example, uh, one of the biggest problems in the cannabis community right now is banking. Um, we don't really have a, a surefire way to bank and we, you know, we can't get loans like normal businesses can. Um, and it's really been a cash business for, for a very long time, which presents a lot of diff difficulties. Um, so once the federal uh, legalization happens or, or federal kind of um, understanding that they're going to deschedule it, um, but still have regulations on a substance, you know, rightfully so. Um, we can see normal banking happening, which will really reduce risk in our industry, um, put us on par with other businesses and, and really open up um, a growth mechanism for um, operating and, again, becoming more safe. You know, cash businesses in general is just a, a difficult environment to work in. So, yeah, it absolutely matters how the federal government sees um, cannabis, although they have taken a, a, a softer stance in the past decade or so, um, you know, once they turn that tune, we're going to see a lot more opportunities in this industry. And going back to kind of what we can do for Hawaii um, in this industry is we'll see a lot of local people stay. This is going to be an industry that's going to be for local people. And it's not going to be an extractive model um, where a lot of the profits are taken off island. 
Um, we're going to see opportunities here for, for um, young researchers who want to get into hemp, who want to get into cannabis, who want to get into the, the health benefits, um, not only um, selling. So it's going to be a great industry once it really takes off. Well, I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, and you, you've mentioned it a couple of times that it is currently a, a daunting industry to be in. How has the global pandemic affected um, the cannabis industry with its already currently existing challenges? Sure. Um, we were very fortunate enough to be designated an essential service, an essential business during the pandemic. So um, as a medical um, uh, kind of industry that we are providing medicine to people, we were able to continue to operate during the pandemic. Um, so the one thing that we tried to do as an association, though, was really advocate for, um, you know, best practices when we talk about curbside pickup, right? Um, even possibly a delivery option, um, you know, things to reduce contact, because in a medical industry, we're working with immunocompromised individuals, individuals who are, who are getting their medical cards um, tend to have a, uh, or they all have a medical condition that they are using cannabis for. So if we're asking them to travel out um, during the middle of a pandemic and go grab their medicine and come home, that increases their risk to catching COVID or something of that nature. Um, unfortunately, the state didn't grant any of those requests, so we had to operate as normal and still bring people in. Um, and again, as a heavily regulated industry, um, you know, we have a waiting area before you go in and, and to purchase your product. So there's a lot of logistics that had to happen for a lot of the licensees to manage people coming into their establishment, how many people can come in um, and uh, sanitization, all of the things that come with navigating that. So, um, but when it comes down to numbers, um, Hawaii actually did um, decently well during the pandemic uh, when it came to sales and things of that nature. Um, but one of the things I like to highlight is that we saw as an opportunity to really connect with the community. Um, so some of our manufacturing practices um, really was easily transferable to kind of, uh, for example, making um, hand sanitizer. So one of our local dispensaries on Oahu um, ramped up production to make hand sanitizer for first responders and others. Um, and really, we saw um, how crucial an industry like this could be during a time of a pandemic. And um, you know, the more goodwill that we have the ability to, to gain, the better. And we'll see that, you know, we're not just, uh, uh, you know, illicit market coming into the, the legal framework. We're, we're a community member and we're here to kind of uplift and help everybody. So the pandemic brought tons of challenges, but it also brought a lot of opportunities. Love that. Um, as, as someone who is part of the movement that is ushering in the legalization of cannabis in order to uplift the state, what are some lessons that you have learned as an advocate and as the executive director of HICIA? Sure. Um, I think one of the biggest ones for me is, you know, again, I was an advocate on the ground, um, on, on kind of the grassroots level, really, before I came into this position. And there's a lot of issues I still am on the grassroots level on. But when I'm able to see this issue from a very high level now, working with the Department of Health and the regulators, I really understand the issues more deeply. Um, and a lot of the things that maybe I was a little critical of the industry before, I, I completely understand now, right? Um, there's this narrative and myth that the current licensees are kind of like a big monopoly that are making hand over fist money and you know are kind of blocking out those um, who want to get in, which is not the case at all. I mean, no one is really making any money in this industry currently. Um, and that's the hardest part is that we want to see um, cannabis be accepted in, in our community and in our lives. And we have to have successful businesses to do that. Um, and again, going back to making sure it's, it's for the local people, for the local growers, really supporting people that have been doing this for a long time in Hawaii. Um, first and foremost, we have to show that it can be successful and we have a successful model. So um, that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that not everything is as it seems on the ground and getting the most information possible is super important to understanding the entire climate and how we can all work together. Because Hawaii is a place where, uh, as we know, you know, we're stronger when we're together and, you know, we don't want to see some of the larger, you know, Walmarts or targets of cannabis come in and buy out the entire market and then only produce minimum wage jobs and take a lot of those profits off, off island. We want this to be here for our people to gain um, generational wealth and to keep our local people on island. 
I think this has been a, a very valuable conversation, Randy, and thanks for being here today. Um, if we can pull up the HICIA website for people to take a glance, how can people get a hold of you if they want to learn more about the cannabis industry in Hawaii or if they just want to reach out? Sure. So this is a website. It's a great place to visit and to check us out. Um, we have all of our social media links on there where we keep everybody informed. My email address is on this website. It's director at 808 or 808hicia.org. You can email me directly. Um, and we also are always open for associate members. So anyone who's looking to get in the industry or has an ancillary business that wants to help out the industry, we have associate memberships where you can be a part of the conversation with us and help us build an industry that we want to see for our state. Um, so please reach out. And I really look forward to continuing this effort and bringing everybody together. Wonderful. Randy, is there anything else that you would like to add in our last two minutes of the show? Um, just that plant medicine has a large and deep history in Hawaii, and we can't pick and choose which ones are more valid. And I think this is a debate that has already passed that it's just a matter of when, not if, uh, cannabis will be legalized. So uh, it's time to kind of get together and talk about how it's legalized. Thank you again so much for um, the valuable information that you have shared today. I appreciate you being on the show and, and sharing your knowledge and expertise and your passion with our viewers and the community. So mahalo again, Randy. Really appreciate it. And thank you as well to Jay Fidel and the entire staff at Think Tech Hawaii for making programs like this possible. Today we had Michael helping us out. So thank you, Michael, for everything that you do and catch us again. We are on the show every other Wednesday. This has been Kathleen Lee with Randy Gantz, HICAA Executive Director, and we wish you a good week. Aloha.